Okay, well this is attempt number, well, in a sense number two, and in another way, number 564, of trying to figure out how to do a screenshot video of my computer so that I can show you this uh, presentation I made, which was related to the MV equals PY that I just showed you on the study question. Hopefully this will work out. I went through the whole thing last time, and then when I went to save, it uh, uh, had an error. And then when I looked it up online, it said, oh yeah, it, it can't save anything bigger than you know X, which they don't tell you until when you try to save it, uh, it um, has the error. But you know what? That's my problem. That's not yours. So this is, as I said, a, a uh, talk that I gave at the Rotary Club of Colleyville, a place where I'm very popular because I'm absolutely free. Uh, and, and also a friend of mine is, is an officer there. And so this was about, uh, there have been all these warnings that there's going to be terrible hyperinflation since the financial crisis, or, or rather, since the Federal Reserve's very accommodative, uh, stimulative monetary policy since the financial crisis. And they thought, well, they're printing all this money, it's going to cause all kinds of terrible inflation. Well, this turns out to be directly related to the MV equals PY I was just talking about. And so I thought this might be a good way of explaining uh, the underlying logic of that particular theory. So here we go. First, I wanted to show the people in the audience that this is something that's been, been talked about for a while now. And this was very easy to look up. All I had to do was look up hyperinflation and then you know, plug in on the, on the search tools to say, I want something from 2010, I want something from 2011, and so forth. So here's somebody saying, not, not, not will it happen, but how in hyperinflation is going to happen in America back in 2010. Well, it didn't happen, but that's okay. In 2011, whoever this person is put out special commentary number 357, which is what this person says to make themselves feel important since this was typed in their parents' basement. Um, but this is, you know, it's going to happen any day now. The United States nears hyperinflationary Great Depression, you know, and on and on there. No, it, it's, it's horrifying. But it didn't happen. But that's okay. It's going to happen in 2012. And as it says here, look down the bottom uh, in, the, in the center there. Hyperinflation is virtually assured because the Fed doesn't have any options left. Note that the webpage also points out how to buy gold and silver, which suggests that the person who runs this webpage is actually making their money by selling advertising and not because they really know what's going to happen. Oh, oh I, and I also like the little uh, sub-headline under USA Watchdog, analyzing the news to give you a clear picture of what's really going on. Well, I had to subscribe to this webpage, I guess, because I want to know what's really going on. 2013. I know it hasn't happened yet, but it's just around the corner. This one embarrasses me a bit, to tell you the truth, because it's actually by an economist. 2014. I know it didn't happen in 2010. I know it didn't happen in 2011 or 2012 or 2013. But an expert has warned of hyperinflation. The American way of life will be destroyed. And of course it was. Oh, no, wait, that's right. It wasn't. Um, but that's okay. 2015. Hyperinflation to start in 2015, economist says get supplies, gold, silver, canned goods, toilet paper, bottled water. That wasn't me that said that, by the way. Uh, oh, hey, you know what I just noticed? On the bottom left down there where it says MacSlavoSHTFplan.com, that was one of the earlier web, uh, earlier web pages. That's this one right here, the SHTFplan.com. Well, I'll be darned. Okay, so... And you can find lots of these things, uh, tons of them saying it's going to happen any day now. Well, you know, I make fun of these people here, but of course there was terrible hyper hyperinflation since the financial crisis. In fact, let's have a look at the data. In the 1970s, the average rate of inflation was 7.1% per year. In the 1980s, it was 5.6% per year. 1990s, 3.0%. And then 2000s up to the financial crisis, 2.8%. But then look at the massive rate of inflation since the financial crisis in 2008. Oh, oh, that's true. It's, it's a lot smaller than all the other numbers. And, and that, that's the problem. I mean, this, this whole hyperinflation thing, not only was there no hyperinflation, which there's really no technical term for that, or no technical definition, rather, for what hyperinflation is, but it's sure not 1.7. Uh, and if 7.1 and if wasn't hyperinflation, then we're a long way away from that. I also, as you can see underneath there, broke it down by year with QEs next to the years when the Fed was undertaking quantitative easing operations. Well, question one, why did people expect inflation? And question two, why didn't it happen? Oh, 
I should be hitting the little key here on the keyboard a little quieter, shouldn't I? I'm terribly sorry. Now, here's that Einstein guy that we've all heard so much about. Whether you can observe a thing or not depends on the theory which you use, which, of course, we've talked about in class. Uh, the particular way you are interpreting the world and which variables you believe are most important are going to define what you notice in the world and what you assume about the various interactions. So, the next question I want to answer here is, well, what exact theory were these hyperinflation warnings coming from? And it was the quantity theory of money, the MV equals PY that I just showed you in the study question uh, for you a moment ago, for me hours ago, since I've been spending all this time trying to get this darn software to work. So here's the MV equals PY again, and I, and I didn't explain it, well, a very little before, and, and, and so let, let me go into a little bit more detail now. M is the supply of money, or as it says down below the little uh, diagram there, number of dollar bills. Think of it as the number, let's say we don't have electronic money, we only have printed money. It's the number of printed dollar bills in circulation in the United States. The velocity is the number of times each one of those dollar bills tends to be used on average. So, for example, if there were a thousand one dollar bills and on average each one got used five times, then over the course of whatever time period we're talking about here, let's say it's a year, there must have been five thousand dollars worth of transactions. One thousand dollars used an average of five times. Well, that five thousand dollars worth of transactions on the left must be equal to the dollar value of all the stuff that was purchased on the right. And the Y is the number of things that were purchased, and the P is the average price level of each one. So those two have to add up to the same number, and in fact, there is no controversy among economists about this equation so far. Uh, in fact, you see the three equal signs there? Uh, you probably already know this because you're uh, advanced uh, scholarly people, unlike some of the people I give talks to, they want to know why there are three equal signs. Well, it's because it's an identity. I mean, this, this is not, um, uh, this is like saying batting average is equal to the number of hits divided by at-bats. Well, of course it is. That's how we defined it. So, now an example. Let's say that the money supply is 100 and that each dollar bill gets used an average of three times then M times V, or the dollar value of all the transactions, must be $300. So therefore, the money spent on all the goods and services is also $300. And if there were 50 of those goods and services, as you see under Y, then the average price must have been $6 each item. Five or, you know, 50 times 6 is the same thing as 100 times 3. Or let's jump down to the next you know, uh, row down here. With the same money supply and velocity, but with 200 things being purchased, the average price level must have been $1.50 each. All right, so that's how MV equals PY is supposed to work. Now, let me show you what happens if we start increasing the money supply. And, and let me point out two things here. That, that, uh, first of all, notice I never changed the V. That's because in the study question I gave you earlier, the assumption under the monetarist model was that velocity is constant. So that's what, I'm, that's what I'm doing here. I'm trying to give their view of the way MV equals PY works. And why they think velocity is constant is because they believe that it's linked to people's habits and the structure of the financial institutions, neither, neither of which changes very quickly. For example, let's say that it took a year after you wrote a check for the check to clear. Well, now the velocity of money is going to be very low. You know, after you spent $100 at Target, it's going to be a year before Target, before the, you know, the check actually clears and Target can use that money. As opposed to the way it really works, where it's, it's cleared you know, almost instantaneously and Target can use the money almost right away. Uh, so as the technology in the financial industry becomes more advanced, so the velocity of money might be expected to increase. So this is, you know, this is the idea that the technology doesn't change that quickly, so therefore let's just assume velocity is constant. A little bit more to it than that, but that's a good explanation uh, for now. It's all you need for this class. Now, under Y, you see I've left it at 200 the whole time. And this, too, is from a monetarist assumption that we are already at full employment. All right, uh, That was also in the study question that I went over. And note how this is consistent with the entire neoclassical approach, you know, at monetarism being a part of neoclassicism, that the economy automatically tends towards full employment, so let's just assume they're there already and do our analysis from there. So we're already producing as much as we can possibly produce, 200. Now, of course, that would grow over time, but let's just keep it you know, simple right now. We're at 200. Velocity is 3. What happens if you start increasing the money supply? And you know, the answer is pretty obvious. Uh, in the first row there, 300 is N times V. And if we have 200 things, then the average price must have been $1.50 each. 
If we double the money supply, what happens under the price column? It doubles. And if we increase the money supply by another 50% from 200 to 300, then no surprise, prices increase from 3 to 4.5, uh, which is going to be another you know 50% increase. So what that means is then that you know here are their three premises. All right, the first one is that m times v equals p times y, and as I said, nobody really disagrees with that. Premise number two, v is stable, and not everyone agrees with that, but this is what we're going with here in the mantras view. Premise number three, y is constant, uh, and if, if this were perspectives in macro where we do this in much more detail, I would actually do these things all in growth rates, the growth rate of money supply, the growth rate of velocity, and so forth. So, uh, but here, we're just going to do it as a level. Why is it constant at a particular level? Uh, what did I do? 200? Yeah, for example, 200. Okay, therefore, I mean, look at that. Look at the equation in, in premise one. M times V equals P times Y. If V cannot change and Y cannot change, then whatever happens with M is going to happen to P. If M doubles, P doubles. If M falls by, you know, if, if, v, if M is halved, P is halved. So what did they think happened during the financial crisis? They thought that the, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I guess I should back up and finish that off then. So why did they expect inflation? Because the money supply went up. The money supply went up a lot. So they therefore expected how much inflation? A lot. Well, why didn't it happen? Well, you know, that, that's obviously a point of contention, uh, but uh, the post-Keynesians, for example, would say, well, look, premises two and three are wrong. Premise two, velocity is stable. Actually, velocity tends to fall in recessions. People spend money less quickly in recessions. They hold on to it. They're scared. They hold on to the money. Just like we said the other day with the uncertainty, the fundamental uncertainty, people are worried about the future. Not only do they save, but they'll hold on to cash because they're worried. So, and indeed, Federal Reserve studies have shown that the, that the velocity of money collapsed after the financial crisis as people held on to cash. Second, why was not constant. After the financial crisis was, you know, the, the recession associated with it had ended, then the economy did grow, all right? So why did go up, and, and by quite a bit. So I, in this example, I give you an example down here to show, hey, it's possible for the money supply to triple and yet have no change in the price level whatsoever. Now, I just made up these numbers as an example for the people in the Colleyville Rotary Club. I do not claim these to be proportional to what really happened, but the idea is that if we have a fall in velocity, which we would expect after something like, you know, like the financial crisis, and if output recovers from the low level that it would have reached during the financial crisis, then it's possible here with the numbers I've made up for the money supply to triple, and yet prices actually stay exactly the same. But the goal here was not so much to show you that, was to show you how MV uh, equals PY works. And uh, I thought it would be easier to see how it worked with a specific example like this. And I believe, yeah, yeah, that's a, I may do some of this other stuff here later. Uh, I'm going to see how much time all this took. I figured I'd give you about an hour's worth of lecture. Uh, and I did about 30 minutes on the first one. So let me sign off for now. And uh, hopefully this software actually worked. I'll find out in just a second. Au revoir.